Hello and welcome to another episode of the Waterstones podcast. I'm Will Rycroft and this year I wanted to bring you a series of episodes that would group authors together by genre or theme. I'm always looking for these connections between books and the two books that are going to feature today um, I had thought were connected simply by an event that's in both of them which is the Aberfan disaster of 1966 but as we'll see hopefully in this conversation these two very different books actually share some stylistic and thematic qualities that actually go way beyond the real life event that connects them. Um, I'm calling this episode Consequences, but as we shall see, this isn't simply a case of one thing causing another. It is hopefully way, way more interesting than that. So it's my pleasure, first of all, to welcome Sam Knight, who as a staff writer at The New Yorker has written about everyone from Theresa May to Ronnie O'Sullivan. And his first book, The Premonitions Bureau, is a real nonfiction highlight for this year. It is, incorporates psychic visionaries, uh, a crumbling mental hospital, and even one of the Bee Gees. So first of all, welcome, Sam. Thank you very much for having me. And I'm equally thrilled to welcome Joe Browning Rowe, whose debut novel, A Terrible Kindness, was published earlier this year. It is a really wonderful, heartfelt novel, uh, and it shows how repressed emotions and memories can have really big consequences um, on our relationships. And I would be lying if I pretended that even this cold-hearted reader uh, didn't shed a tear or two as he got to the end of this book. So uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you too, Joe. Thanks, Will. Thank you. So, Sam, I'm going to start with you. And I want to ask, with the Premonitions Bureau, how you first discovered John Barker, the man who's at the centre of it, and maybe if you could tell us a little bit about who he was and, and why he's so fascinating. Yeah, sure. So I, um, you know, talk about talk about consequences. You know, I kind of, um, it's sort of very trivial, but one one day, Quite a, quite a while ago now, I was thinking about w what the feeling of of knowing that something was going to happen, um, and and what do you do with that knowledge? Who actually would would listen to you? I don't think it's a particularly benign form of 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 knowledge, but just having a, a certainty that something was going to happen, and 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 who 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 might believe you, or what would you do with that? information and so I mean it's literally you know a, a, you know a, sat, a Saturday uh, and I uh, went to the British Library and got out you know and started looking through a bunch of books about premonitions and prophecy and kind of feelings of of the future and came across a couple of paragraphs about this experiment called you know the Premonitions Bureau which existed in the 1960s and I immediately was kind of drawn to this amazing name but assumed that it would just be a kind of cranky thing um, and, and, and that the people behind it would be sort of desperately insisting that you believe in, you know, the paranormal or the occult or something like that. But instead, I found this, this figure called, called John Barker and Barker was a respected psychiatrist. He was a kind of modern progressive doctor practicing in the 1960s. He had a senior job at a large mental hospital. Um, and yet alongside his, his day job, he did also have this kind of this foot in the other in the other sort of mid 20th century British world of of premonitions and precognition and the strange workings of of time, I suppose. So he was he was a, a person who who had these two parts of his kind of personality kind of rubbing up alongside each other. I mean, as you say, we instinctively most people would sort of say that they know that the idea of premonitions is is nonsense, and yet we all know that feeling you just described, which is that we have that thing where we'll kind of think of somebody, the phone rings. And it's them on the phone. And there's no reason why you would have been thinking about them otherwise. And it just seems very, very odd. And John Barker was thinking about some of these ideas when the Aberfan disaster occurred. And he went to visit the site, didn't he? And was struck by this idea of the tiny things that had made a difference as to whether people were there and killed by that landslide or, or whether they had, had another decision had taken them away from the site. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 exactly. I mean, he at the time he was he was working on a book called "Scared to Death," which was sort of a, 
about exactly what it sounds like, what happens to to people who are kind of terrified that they're that they're going to die. And he heard in the early kind of confused news reports from Aberfan that that might have happened to a child who might have escaped unharmed from the disaster, but but later kind of died of shock. It wasn't correct. It wasn't um, it wasn't right. But but Barker, you know, rushed to 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 the disaster zone in a you know in a way that I I still can't quite understand you know he worked in a mental hospital a hundred miles away I'm sure in you know Joe's research along with mine there wasn't in those first few days and hours of the the disaster there was no call for psychiatrists or mental health support this was this was in a very different time in a very different type of community later social workers and counselors did do a lot of work in Abervan but it was something that only happened months afterwards um but Barker rushed to the scene in this slightly kind of unseemly way and was and was himself taken aback and realized that he'd sort of arrived too soon you know in the in the in the, in the middle of this kind of in the middle of this catastrophe but while he was there he began to kind of pick up on these kind of on these you know on these the, these 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 stories and and conversations going on in um in the village about people who had had dreams or strange decisions on the day which had saved lives and you know and, and ended other, ended others and he and he was very interested in in the kind of the rational and less rational nature of those so his idea basically was to take that idea of of people maybe having dreams or sort of feelings that might help us to avert disasters that if he could get enough people to share what they had experienced if there was a kind of correlation of, of thought that they might be able to pinpoint where something might be happening in the future and avert that disaster is that is that the basic idea of the premonitions bureau that's the basic idea after Aberfan, he teamed up with a journalist at the evening standard and they collected about 70 plausible premonitions of, of the Aberfan disaster from across the country um, and then they used those uh, but you know the, the problem was obviously everyone reports their successful premonition after the thing has come to pass um, and and they had the idea that instead of reporting things afterwards they would ask the public just to send in their premonitions about anything um, and then log those over the course of a year and compare them to things that actually came to pass so a kind of open-ended uh, experiment and Barker's kind of idealized vision of this thing would, would was was one day to kind of collect you know dreams and visions and forebodings of the british public on a on a mass scale and to somehow kind of feed these into a into a computer that could then look for kind of peaks and patterns and and sort of similarities uh, and, and and that maybe you could sort of these might coalesce around something that you could one day kind of issue a, a warning on the basis of, I mean, it's kind of, it's really, uh, it, 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 it takes something that many of us are kind of familiar with, as you described, and tries to sort of imagine it on an industrial uh, scale, which is pretty out there. Yeah, it absolutely is. I, mean, I suppose one of the literary versions of this that people might be aware of, or if they've seen the film Minority Report, would be the, the precogs in in that story. So this idea of, of being able to stop crime before it happens in this case to stop disaster before it happens good yeah totally good parallel yeah um i suppose we're not going to be able to really get into the nitty-gritty of theories about time and how it works in this podcast but one of the problems with the idea of premonition that you do raise is is that if if the basic idea is that some kind of disaster is in essence sending a signal of itself back to us in the past that if you successfully avert that disaster it cannot then occur in order to send its warning back to you so that raises a paradox doesn't it with the whole idea of premonition and using it to avert disaster and you know barker was was fully you know was fully aware of this and kind of struggled with this with this paradox because you're you know you're 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 totally right how can you have a vision of something which doesn't occur because you stop it happening um and i think the you know the the, <laughs> the counterweight to that 
is the idea that we have made unaccountable decisions that have seemed to avoid, you know, the disaster. You know, the stories of the people who don't, you know, make it onto the plane that crashed or the people who kind of, you know, there's a wonderful study of um, train accidents in the 1950s where someone analysed casualties from railway accidents and they, they found that, you know, almost without fail, trains that are derailed are carrying fewer passengers than the corresponding service of the same week at the same time, the same thing. And th th there's always, you know, these kind of wonderful uh, examples, tantalising examples of some kind of, um, you know, inexplicable collective awareness. Um, the, the Premonitions Bureau, as you say, was sort of made up of lots of people sent in their, their premonitions to Barker. Um, but what's really fascinating about your book is that really there were two people who seemed to score, if you like, much higher rates of success than anybody else. And yeah. they were they were quite consistent. Would you mind telling us a little bit more about those two people? So the, so the, 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 so the two people that sort of emerged as the sort of the stars of the Bureau, as it were, were one was a, a music teacher in North London called Kathleen Middleton. And the other was a... Um, switchboard operator for the post office. He worked on the international switchboard near Blackfriars Bridge, a man called Alan Hencher. And yes, over the course of the year, they, they did seem to have a, a much kind of higher hit rate, as it were, and made some, you know, very eerie uh, predictions uh, about plane crashes and a railway disaster in November 1967. Um, and, and, and they, they seemed you know, they seemed they seemed good at it, and it was something they'd sort of lived with it for for a long time. And 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 what happened over the over the course of the the experiment is that they sort of became aware that they were good at it as well. And this kind of raised some some pretty kind of complicated ethical and kind of uh, moral sort of quandaries between the the people having the visions and then the people kind of recording them. It, it seems to take quite a toll on on both of them. They, they it sort of exerted, uh, sort of physical and as you say, like a mental cost I, on, on them both. I, I I I agree. I agree, and I think that they were sort of, on the one hand, you long to be listened to and taken seriously, but then when it happens, uh, it was it was deeply you know it was deeply unnerving, particularly for for Alan Hencher, who I don't think enjoyed having these premonitions uh, at all. And th they both had something that they wanted to share with John Barker himself as the as the experiment if you like continued they they both had a, a sensation about him which takes the whole story into a almost completely different area doesn't it well yes they they they, they became they became worried about him and, 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 and in the spring of 1967 Alan Hatcher told Barker that he was he was he was worried that he was going to die um and and Barker you know that kind of somewhat kind of divided kind of personality sort of manifested itself on the one hand he was I don't want to say dismissive but he was kind of like oh we have to sort of see where this goes uh and 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 also really alarmed and freaked out by it um but he didn't stop or decide to study something else which I think other people might have um might 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 have might have considered um, you mentioned that you know he he had a, a senior position in a, in a mental hospital uh, in the UK, and of course, whilst all of this is going on, he's he's going about his his daily work, um, and I presume with a fair amount of ridicule coming in his direction because of being a respected psychiatrist, but doing this work that is vaguely occultish, you know, sort of looking at the ideas of premonition, and even his idea about being scared to death was, was probably a little bit out there at the time. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you have to be you know, a little bit, um, you know, a little bit kind of careful of, a, you know, of a few things, you know, Barker, as I said, was the uh, senior psychiatrist at Shelton Hospital, which was just outside Shrewsbury. On the one hand, it was a kind of isolated county asylum, which sort of meant that there wasn't a huge amount of kind of original kind of medical thinking and research taking place there. On the other hand, it gave him great freedom to explore these ideas with kind of relatively little 
scrutiny. I think he, he you know, he had a, a, a close colleague there called David Enoch, who kind of wonderfully is, is still alive and in his mid 90s uh, in Wales, a very distinguished psychiatrist. And, you know, and I chatted with him when I was kind of researching the book and, and they, they shared a lot of their research interests and Barker did not share this research agenda with, with David at the time. Um, because he clearly had a sense of how it was viewed by the kind of the medical mainstream. And when he would publish letters or publish articles, uh, there would almost invariably be a kind of wave of very dismissive kind of replies uh, in the kind of correspondence pages of the medical news or the Lancet or where he was, where he was airing, where he was airing these ideas. But I, you know, I, you know, one of the things that I, you know, thought about when I was, writing the book was about you know this was a, this was a period of psychiatry of really really dramatic change of of where new drugs and new forms of treatment were allowing people who'd suffered with terrible um psychosis and serious mental illness for you know a long long time was suddenly seeing the benefits of new forms of of treatment and i do think this was you know the mid 60s was just generally in the realm of kind of medicine and scientific progress there were there were Im there were impossible things happening um, you think of Barker working in this, in this, in this mental hospital where people have been locked up for thirty or forty years with no hope of release, and suddenly they can speak. Sometimes, suddenly they can take a walk and 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 be able to, you know, show signs of enjo enjoying a day or their life again. You know, dramatic things were happening. So I, I sometimes think of when Barker was thinking about his 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 dealings with people who were severely ill and then someone like Alan Henshaw comes across seeming to have a, a, a vision of a plane before it crashes. It doesn't seem so impossible to him. Do you see what I mean? I, that was something yeah. that, I kind of, that I, that I, you know, you, it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, fascinating to hear what kind of Joe thinks about this, but you've just got to be kind of so careful about our own mindset and outlook and kind of, and, and putting that, putting that, back to a, you know a time like the mid 60s mm. um joe I'll, I'll come to you now um uh, sam mentioned earlier that that sort of rushing to the scene um which is absolutely the first propulsion in in your novel your character william who is a young 19 year old man who is just qualified as an embalmer and hears about what's happened and and feels this compulsion to go there and help tell, could you tell us a little bit about him as a character and, and, and where that compulsion comes from? Well, I think um, that the reader quite quickly gets a sense that his, um, his move into this profession was conflicted because although it's his third generation family, his mother didn't actually want him to become an embalmer. She wanted him to follow his um, musical gift. Um, and so at the point that the story begins, we, we know he's just qualified um, and done exceptionally well. But um, again, we don't quite know why at that point, but he's, he feels really awkward about lots of attention being put on him as at this dinner dance. Um, and this dinner dance did happen. So, and, and the, the call did come from Aberfan to the embalmers at their annual dinner dance. So, you know, that actually happened that, you know, it was, inter it was um, interrupted with a, tele a telegram saying, please come and help. And so that is, you know, that, that, that's what happened. And what, um, what prompted me with William was that I spoke to one embalmer who'd actually gone as a, he was the youngest one to go. And he told me when I said, can I come and interview you? And there's enormous sensitivity around this because obviously some people don't want to talk about it. Um, and he said very chirpily with his lovely Birmingham accent, um, he said, oh, I'd love to talk to you because I've got fairly romantic associations with Aberfan, which was <laughs> most unexpected. And um, But what, what it was was that he had come straight back from his honeymoon. I think he was 20 literally come back from his honeymoon, unpacked, and then went to Aberfan. Um, and what he said was, although obviously it was awful, and, and when he was talking to me about it, he, he did weep. But he said, nevertheless, I was cocooned by this sense of being in love. You know, it, 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 it affected the way he experienced it and remembered it. And so mm. that made me think, well, what when people go into these situations, their own baggage and their own now, as it were, affects how they experience it and how they come away from it as well. And so that was this idea of sending somebody in who was already fractured and had their own deep sense of loss that they hadn't dealt with at all. Um, and and so so for him, in the moment of, of, of getting that call, he thought, 
this is better than me sitting here and having to deal with everyone saying well done because that was excruciating for him because of a former experience which we'll find out about and so he had this enormous sense of let me just go let me do what I know I can do well and and be some of some help we we will come to his his former experience because uh, that's one of my favorite things about the structure of your book but but first of all I want to come to your former experience because I I, I read that you actually grew up in a crematorium is that right yes I did um because my my dad was a superintendent so it was a you know small bungalow within the grounds of a crematorium and I went there when I was one and I left there when I was 12 so for those very very formative years it was my playground you know so once the gates were closed at six and it was a brand new crematorium so it's beautifully landscaped no memorials or gravestones at all it was just a beautiful garden with a lake and a little fountain and hills and trees to climb um, and so, and a crematory in which we could learn to skate because it was a great big open space with no furniture. So, um, yeah, so when I came across a story of the embalmers, I think what happened was it, um, it just, it was very easy to sort of get involved in that world and to consider talking to embalmers and undertakers because that was a world that I already knew. Mm. Um, as I said at the beginning, I, I think I expected when I started A Terrible Kindness that it was going to be a novel about a man who, is affected by this first experience in Aberfan, uh, and we discover how it affects him in later life. But what you do is you then take us back. We go back in time, and this is why these books have this fascinating movement of time in them. And we discover, actually, there's another formative experience in his life, which is based in his time as a chorister. Um, I suppose my, my first question it would, was, how did you set about the structure of the book and were you always clear that we were going to be going back to discover more about him before we then discover what happens afterwards? Yeah. Well, I think I set about it in a very ham-fisted way is the answer to that. And just lots of, <laughs> lots of trial, lots of trial and error. Um, and um, I remember hearing one author, he was a Booker winner. It was um, uh, Flanagan. He wrote The Long Road North. I can never remember the title of it, but it's great. Book Flanagan, yeah. That's it. And he said this book had so many formats. He said at one point it was a haiku, which really I just really made me laugh. And I just think, you know, you know, the heart of what you're trying to express. But I did always know it was going to jump around. I, I always thought I'd start in Aberfan with him actually doing an embalming, actually in the heart of the horrible heart of it and then jump around. And part of that, I think, is because my ultimate read is I love a book that's character led and well written, but nevertheless has a page turning quality that there's a real it really keeps pulling you back. And you want to know. And so I think that was probably why I, I did that. But anyway, all the feedback was um, that the book just jumped around too much. And will you give us a break and just let us settle down in one place? And so one particularly good, good, um, very sort of talented um, structural editor said to me, just start at the dinner dance, just get starting there getting through to the end of Aberfan and then decide what you want to do. And that was enormously helpful. Um, so there was th different ways that I jumped around. But once I once I knew I was going to have that main Aberfan bit at the beginning, um, it, it sort of it, it helped. But it was enormous trial and error. I mean, oh, gosh, that was most of the work for me was was wrestling structure into a, mm. a, a decent shape. <laughs> that is the writer's work. The mm. writing's the easy bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, with William as a character, as we said, it, we go back to his, his childhood and, and we see how events um, obviously have a huge impact on, on his character and, and how he behaves later in life. But this is always based in his relationships, whether that's with friends and particularly with his family. And we spoke with Sam earlier about how this period was actually quite a progressive period. There was lots of change happening. And your family setup is, is, I guess, in some ways quite progressive because of the way in which William is cared for by his uncle in many ways. His uncle is gay and has a partner. And there is this quite complicated, I suppose, family dynamic there, which only gets more complicated as time goes on, of course. That seems to me to be a huge part of what the book is about. Is that right for you? Yes, definitely. Um, and I, I have such a hard time pinpointing any moments when I decided that this was going to be you know, important for the book. And, and I've never, I never sat down with themes. You, you know, you write the story, you write, and then you stand back and you think, what's, what's it about? And you try and then hone it a bit to make it more clearly about that. But I think, I mean, um, my husband and I did 
when we've had our first child, we were actually, we owned a house and lived with um, a guy who had recently come out as gay. So we'd known him when he was married um, to a woman and then it all fell apart and he decided, right, I'm going to just, you know, try and give this a go. And we were, so we were very much living in community with him at that time. We were all reading Armistead Maupin books that were coming out at the time that, you know, the Tales of the City stories, which are very much set in San Francisco, but about straight and gay people living together, not in, not in sort of little, you know, sort of um, sub um, cultures, but together. So I, that's just part of me, I guess. Um, but also, yeah, just reflecting on in that. I do remember this, at the early 60s, I was very young, but I do remember just the, the aesthetic of it and the feel of it. And the and then my dad, one, he, one of his one of his deputies was definitely a gay man. And it was there was all these nods to it. Nobody ever articulated it, but we all knew. Um, so all that, all that seemed to come fairly naturally to me, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, family dynamics are so, co- they're so complicated. <laughs> My very, very best friend is a therapist and I, I have coffee there twice a week and have done for 30 years. And so lots of discussions about all that sort of thing, including PTSD, actually. So yeah, that was a really messy answer, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best kind of answer. <laughs> um, now, yeah, you sort of mentioned there PTSD and, and th- there are these, these traumas, if you like, that William carries through his life. And there is this repression of emotion. And one of the things that I suppose carries that and cuts through it, I suppose, in later in the book is music and song. And in particular, sort of the idea of, of choir and, and, and choristry. And I know from my own experience that music and singing is, is an incredibly powerful carrier of emotion to the point where it's sometimes quite hard You'll see this even on programmes like The Voice or Britain's Got Talent, that if somebody gets very emotional, they actually can't sing because you can't can't control the muscles that do that. But do you mind telling Because the, the song is so beautifully captured in the book and the importance of singing and how it carries emotion. Would you mind telling us a little mm. bit more about that? Well, I do. Um, so much of this novel came out of interviews and I spent quite a lot of time talking to men who were choristers in the 50s. Um, and one of them did actually say just what you'd said. He said, the terrible thing, of course, is that your vo- you can't hide emotion from your voice. But, <laughs> but, but nevertheless, you see, I, when I've been to lots of these wonderful performances in Cambridge choirs, in Cambridge colleges over the years, and I've always think, what if it went wrong? You know, there's this little boy stands up and he just does this huge solo in front of an, you know, packed audience on the high days and holidays of international strangers. What if it went catastrophically wrong but it just seemed and all the choir boys I talked to and choir masters it just doesn't happen because they're well trained and they're well supported and they're brilliant you know <laughs> but nevertheless the storyteller in me couldn't let go of that um mm. but the the Allegris Miserere which is the main piece of music I heard when I was young and I wasn't surrounded by classical music and uh, my parents didn't particularly know much about it but that one piece my dad played to me when I was very young um, and I think the beauty of it is very accessible. You don't have to know a lot about music just to be able to catch the beauty of that. And when he said to me, that voice is a boy about the same age as you, honestly, you could have, it, it was staggering to me that a child could make that noise, you know, and have the, the you know, the, the, the possession to do it. So so I think that's all might be interest. It was always, it would always be Allegra's Misery because it is sort of the solo to get. And it was the one that I knew about so it was always going to be that one but I did, it was hard work that trying to describe it you know I did spend hours and hours and hours with it on the headphones each bar trying to capture what what was happening and put it in the best words to describe it so it was it was a labour of love <laughs> <laughs> well you can tell um uh, this question will apply to both of you really but one of the skills for for any writer is the ability to withhold um information or emotion or whatever it is until you need it to usually towards the end of the book um joe i've already confessed that you you had me in tears uh, towards the end of your book and part of that is to do with how you've structured the narrative but also of course the 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 payoff that comes towards the end was that again part of the hard work of, of putting the book together making sure that you had left enough for that sort of final bit towards the end Yes, I mean, I, I knew that the end was going to all be all about reconciliations. So to his mother, to his wife, to him, to, to Abba Van, really, and his relationship with it. Um, I mean, I, it, I'm always interested when people say it was the emotion. Was it the very end you were talking about when he does go back to Abba Van? Was that the bit? Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and what's interesting was that it was it was almost another character who, you know, that yeah. sort of 
started me off and I was like, I don't think I'm going to be able to get through these pages. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I felt when I was um, researching up a van, I was shown around the village by a man who'd grown up in the village from the age of, you know, he was two when it happened. He didn't lose any direct family, but obviously was affected hugely by it. And he was very keen to say that there were a lot of positive things about his upbringing. Of course, there was awful things, but the grown-ups were wonderful and his family were wonderful. And so he he was very keen to sort of put that across to me. So I, I always felt I wanted, I wanted when we went back to Aberfan, I wanted to show a positive healing thing that would come from the Aberfan people themselves rather than being sort of, you know, dumped on them by somebody else. Do you know what I mean? I wanted them to be the, the source of it. Um, mm. Yeah. And, and for you, Sam, similarly, you obviously had to do a huge amount of research before writing the book, which means that you are in possession of all of the facts, if you like, before when you come to sit down and write it. And you get to decide in which order you tell it. And in a similar way to Joe, you're able to move forwards and, and backwards in time to illuminate the reader with all that you discovered, ignoring time's arrow, as you describe it in the book, with the sort of idea of linear time and that definitely pays off. But again, it must have been a huge marshalling of information with everything that you gleaned in your research. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think how, how to um, how to describe it. I mean, I just I think in terms of the, the process of of researching and 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 writing the story, I I knew from from quite early from quite early on the kind of overall scaffolding and, 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 and story, my my problem was could I could I unearth enough information about the people involved in this very little known experiment to sort of to actually write about it with you know sufficient detail and texture and not make anything up you know there, you know this is you know my you know no but i mean there, 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 you know there were times where i thought well is this actually the kind of the germ of a novel rather than a, a, a non-fiction story that i can tell just because you're just entirely at the mercy of what has survived in people's you know in people's memories and in sort of strange cardboard boxes in the in the garage and stuff like that so so my in terms of sort of marshalling information for the book it was it was it was more like okay i've got to understand the evening standard newsroom you know in 1967 who is around that can and so you look and you you know it sounds like joe you did very similar work for your novel you know i came across you know found some people who were working in that newsroom one of them because people's memories are amazing could draw me the floor plan of the office could, could tell me who could sit where and where the windows were and where the light came in and what the sounds that were made every day and these little racks that photos would get hauled on string across the across the office and and you know there was a amazing guy who worked in Shelton as a as a porter as a an 18 year old uh, it was his first job you know he'd worked in a chicken factory and then he saw a job advertised to be a porter in this mental hospital that was slightly better paid but it was you know it was his first job that indelible kind of memory that you have of your first job and he was able to tell me you know the smells the sound where he would go on his breaks you know all all the stuff that sort of brings these brings these forgotten places you know to life again one of the major themes that again I think applies to both books is is to do with how hard it can be to change the course that you're on um obviously Joe for for William it is a way that he thinks he has to live his life based on previous experience and and how hard it is for him to to change that and I guess Sam this whole idea of of premonition and whether things are fated to happen or not, if you avoid one thing, you maybe set another course of action in, in, in on its tracks. Um, was that, Sam, you know, sort of, did that feel like a, a strong theme in the book as you were finding John Barker's story? Yeah, that's really, that's a really fascinating question. I'm, how to, <laughs> how to begin to answer. Uh, <laughs> I mean, one thing I'll just be honest, I, I, I never got never got my head around and and just in the end just retreated back from was 
the position of being, a, you know, telling a story and being a storyteller and knowing, you know, the, the, the question of, you know, of, of, of premonitions and seeing things before they happen is, you know, you you see these tiny fragments and then you, you know, two and two makes five and you jump onto the next thing. But if you're telling the story, you're actually, you're in control of what happens next. Uh, and so you can shape the future. Um, and so you almost, you know, you know too much. I don't know if that's making, probably doesn't make any sense at all the way I describe it. But I, I, in the end, I just backed away from this problem and just tried to tell the story as kind of as simply as as I possibly could. And unlike, you know, Joe's book, which very kind of deftly moves backwards and forwards and, and fills these things, you know, and, and fills these things, I actually just wrote mine in the most sort of linear chronological way that I could think of, just probably as a way of not dealing with this uh not not dealing with this not dealing with this problem but i um you know with barker in particular there is this he could have changed path many many points along the way and he didn't um and that's and that's immediately the kind of character that i think you know if you're writing non-fiction or if you're writing fiction you're kind of you're 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 drawn to and uh joe um for William, obviously a, a fictional character, which I guess puts you in the same kind of uh, godlike position of being able to decide what happens to him. But uh, did it feel like that as an author, or did the narrative sort of always feel like it was heading in that in that same direction? I think um, I did always have a quite a, a developed sense of William. Uh, you know, I, I I often say this. I get very irritated with authors who say, you know, in a slightly mystical way that characters take on a life of their own and it's something to do with me. <laughs> it really irritates me, but. Nevertheless, I did feel I know who he is and I know what his problem is. And his problem is that he jeopardises his own happiness all the time. He's got what he needs to be happy. But because he felt he has to make binary choices between they're the goodies, they're the baddies. She did something wrong. He didn't. You know, that, that choice is he, he was put in a very early age of having to feel he had to choose between different sides of his family. And so then he gets trapped in a story that he has to tell himself. And um and so I just wanted to, I needed to put him in situations that showed that and then situations that could release him from it. And so music was such a big part of his life. The fact he shut that out of his life, I knew if that towards the end, he somehow was able to let that come back in, then that could flow out to all sorts of other healing with all the people around him. I could talk to both of you about so many aspects of these books, but I, I can't keep you here for, for too long. Um, I just wondered, Sam, just one, one final thing. Obviously, you did an awful lot of research for the book, and I wondered what... There's some pretty mad stuff in the book. There's some really fascinating facts and figures and, and chances and consequences, but I wondered whether there was anything particularly that stuck in your brain as being really quite extraordinary. You know, a really important bit of research that I that I did and and for me and, and that kind of helped guide my thinking when I was writing the book is this you know, this quite amazing passage um, written in the kind of late in fact right on the cusp of the, the 17th and 18th century about you know about second sight and and premonitions in in the Hebrides written by a man called Martin Martin he had a Gaelic name that I'm not going to be able to uh, not going to be able to pronounce and it's this very matter of fact you know anthropological discussion really of 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 of, of second sight in the um in the in the western isles and and it's a very kind of compassionate description of a community in which this was part of the normal working of people's consciousness and time and seeing family members uh seeing their kind of future before they came to pass and it was sort of i tried to you know really write this story as if the premonitions bureau was you know a little village uh in the hebrides in the 17th century in which a group of people just for whatever reason got together and, and thought that maybe they were they were onto something and could see things before they before they happened so i think that was probably the most instructive bit of research in a way it was not the most like sensational chance or premonition or whatever but it it, it gave me a, a way of thinking about how to sort of deal with the, the whole story 
Uh, and Joe, obviously, you spoke to many people, you know, who had had some experiences similar to the novel as part of your research. Mm -hmm. And then as a writer of fiction, you're thinking about human nature all of the time. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wonder whether there was anything you feel that you learnt through the process of writing the book that maybe surprised you. Um, I think I, the thing that stands out for me was when I was talking to one of the embalmers and he said to me, um, actually, I don't get emotional talking about it. Unlike others, I don't mind talking about it, but I don't get emotional. And so I said, OK, just tell me what happened when you got what you said you arrived at three in the morning. What happened? And then he described the fact that he'd had to cut a jumper off a small boy, carry it outside and hold it to the parents waiting outside and hold the jumper up and say, whose little boy went to school wearing this? And when he told me that, he broke down. And he, you know, he didn't think he would. <laughs> he thought, and I, I just taught me that as, a, as people and then as writers of human nature, it's those details that unlock the emotion. It, you know, you can't be general about things. That doesn't touch that what touches is is the, those specific little things, um, and that was a very p powerful moment for me in that in that interview. And and I think, as I say, just both for human nature and our experience, and for how to write powerfully about emotion. That's really interesting. I used to have a uh, a, a drama teacher who always used to use the word specificity. Yes, that's what he always used to say was always the key to things. And I think in both of your books, it is the specific details that bring the book alive but also as you say carry that emotion and carry that sort of the importance of the story in both uh, so a very fine note to end on joe thank you for that um i should hold up both books for those who are watching the video version of this um the premonitions bureau looks very much like this it we may be recording this episode in april but i i have what can only be described as a premonition that it will be available in shops by the time you listen to this episode uh, in may and a terrible kindness uh, is also already published and available in Waterstones. Uh, thank you both so much for your time today. It was just great to speak to you both. Um, thank really, you. Really, really Richard, thank you for having me.